Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Jeremiah just received his uh, marching orders from the Lord. And uh, he says, don't, uh, don't you stand there and tell me that you're a little kid. You're a child because uh, you're going to be given my words. And uh, young or not, you're going to go uh, speak my words to these people and uh, tell them exactly what, uh, what it is. And so it is that uh, the beginning of that goes through 50-some chapters of Jeremiah speaking the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 2.1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. Now, he's crying to Jerusalem. I know that the city uh, doesn't hear, but the people of the city hear. And uh, you're going to learn here that, you know, Lord, uh, it's, it's right to say that the Lord cares about people and not just merely land and so on. But it is also, you've got to be careful when you start talking about, you've got to be careful when you start talking about uh, the land of Israel, Judah, Jerusalem. Because, folks, uh, the Lord feels a lot different about that land. I'm talking about the sand and gravel and topsoil <laughs> of uh, Jerusalem and Judea than He does, say, Kansas or Texas, okay? God does love that land. Okay? Uh, verse 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. Now, he's remembering way back when uh, Israel comes out of the wilderness. And so, you know, he's, cry he's saying this to Jerusalem. And so the other thing you recognize about this is the Lord isn't restrained by time in the sense that, you know, it's just one generation that leads to the next generation. And once the next generation comes along, God forgets all about the old generation and it just passes on to the next generation. And, you know, every, each and every generation is new. It's not always that way. I mean, there's a continuity. The Lord remembers the Jerusalem that He loves today is the same Jerusalem that he remembers that was founded, you know, and inhabited by the people that he led out of Egypt all those years ago and so on and so forth. And the way that applies to you is that here you are in the church in uh, 2008, and God still remembers those first espousals and so on of the, that first group of people that joined, quote-unquote, the church way back at Pentecost and so on, back in the earliest days when it really meant something to be a Christian. You understand? I mean, there's a, there's a continuity involved. But to him, it's the same woman. Granted different people and granted time frames and so on, but it's still, a, it's still the same woman. Verse 2, uh, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou winnest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. And what's kind of interesting about that is you go read Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and um, you know it's just it's just one problem after another. You know, I mean, you know they Moses throws his stick down and becomes a snake, and they believe. But you know, as soon as Pharaoh turned around and made their lives harder, then they were mad. And from there on, it was nothing but a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. We like you, we love you. We, we don't like you, we hate you. You know, you brought us out here to kill us. Thank you for delivering us. Oh, you know, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, you brought us out here to kill us. You know, it's just up and down, up and down, up and down. It's just, just mercur mercurial mess, right? And, uh, you know, what, what I would think, you know, somebody would remember coming out of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is what a bunch of stiff-necked brats. But... Oddly enough, the Lord looks back on those days and remembers those as the good days. Which probably says something about just how rotten and just how bad it got when they went into the land of, uh, of, of Palestine and uh, went after the gods of the heathen and so on. Just how uh, offensive that was to God. And it's one thing to have grown up essentially Egyptian. And uh, to have problems getting over it and coming out of the wilderness and it's just hard to walk off into a wilderness where, where there's nothing and expect God to deliver. It takes a lot of faith. But it's another thing when you're a generation of people that have watched God feed you for all those years 
and your very sandals have not worn off of your feet, and the clothes on your back have not worn out, and you got to cross the Jordan River on dry land just like they could cross the Red Sea way back then, and God's gone in and conquered these peoples for you and all that kind of thing, and you still go after their gods. <laughs> so an uh, interesting thing to me is that the Lord still is looking back at Exodus and Leviticus as the good old days. Well, verse uh, 2. Um, I remember thee the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. And again, uh, emphasizing the land that was not sown, they walked off into a wilderness. They walked off, folks, two and a half million people walked off into the, essentially the desert how are you going to feed two and a half million people in the desert? There's not enough game, and it's, a, it's not a land sown. There's no, you, know, you can't just live on corn or wheat because there is no corn or wheat. And it gives you an idea of just how much faith it took to walk off like that. I mean, faith, folks, we have a hard time walking off from, you know, from securities and so on in our lives Imagine what it is for two and a half million people to march off into the backside of nowhere. It's, an ama- it's actually, when you think about it, like it's kind of an amazing thing. Verse 3, so let's get this straight. It's not that Israel lacked more faith than you have, right? We always think of, yeah, they're stiff-necked. That's what God says, stiff-necked. Like you're not. Like, like you pack up your family and walk off into the desert. You know, you're not prepared to, for survival for survival training. Much less are you going out there with two and a half million people. Folks, it would be hard, hard to find a latrine big enough for two and a half million people. How are you going to find water for two and a half million people? How are you going to find food for two and a half million people, right? All right, verse 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. She was, she was holiness unto the Lord, is what he said. Look at the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. She was holiness unto the Lord. Uh, he uh, fought back on those days, and to him they were the good old days, even though there were failures. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. They were holiness unto the Lord. Malachi 2.11, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. That holiness of the Lord had to do, well, in part with the land, in part with the temple, and the holy city of Jerusalem, and so on. And Judah went in there, and uh, joined herself to a false god. Now, folks, there's a reminder about this for me and you. You, got, can't, you can't forget this. Look in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And Israel marches off into the wilderness, and they may not look like holiness unto the Lord, but they are. And the Lord appreciated the fact that whatever else the case, they were kind of driven out of Egypt, granted. But they did march off out there without any provisions and without any way of providing for themselves. And there were gripe guts and there were the mixed multitudes. But that nation did walk out there after Moses and gave God a chance to show them that he could provide for them. Um, You're not to forget the fact that when you uh, trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you began a journey in the wilderness. And uh, the end of it should be Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Let's go back to verse uh, 23 where it says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This thing is supposed to wind up with you uh, putting off the old man, putting on the new, and you are holiness unto the Lord. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Very familiar passage, but 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and don't forget, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. 
none of those things we particularly appreciate. A chosen generation. Well, we like the idea of being chosen, but we don't like the idea of really being chosen for what God chose us for, which is to be odd and which is to not fit here and which is to go against the grain and go against the current of everything in this world. But a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, you're a kingdom of priests. You're, you know, He's made us uh, kings and priests. You're, you're a priesthood, but it's a kingdom of priests. Um, and a holy nation. It's holy. Uh, you are a, uh, you're called to be a holy nation. It's a bad thing when a holy nation is not a holy nation. Right? But it goes on to say a peculiar people. You know what you're supposed to be? You're supposed to be weird. You're supposed to be strange as far as this world's concerned. I know it's a hard lesson, and I know that your parents think, think that's the case. Some of your family thinks that's so, and uh, that, that it, it, they're right. If you really are different, it, they should think that way because you are a peculiar people. You think different than they do. It's, you're peculiar in this life. You're peculiar in this world. You don't think like them. All right, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3. Israel, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. And the first fruits of his increase. She was the first fruits of his increase. He called her out of Egypt. She was, she was the first fruits. Um, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Now we're accustomed to the uh, saying from uh, Genesis 12:3, uh, "Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed be he that curseth thee." Right. We're familiar with the thing in uh, Numbers where uh, Balaam stands up and does tell the truth and says, you know, blessed is he that blesseth thee and cursed be he that curseth thee. We still say that today. This is just another way of saying that. And sometimes, you know, familiar words begin to uh, kind of wax uh, too familiar. And in this case, notice how it's worded. All that devour him, Israel, shall offend. Evil shall come upon them saith the Lord. Now, folks, that's not what you want your country to get off into. Offending, the, offending God over Israel. Um, you're going to see in a little while that that land is God's and God gave it to Abraham. And, uh, you know, you can spiritualize all kinds of stuff all you want to, but the sand in Jerusalem is God's. And it makes him mad that people are standing on that sand right now <laughs> doing what they're doing. <laughs> Well, it says, um, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. If you've ever read that um, Eye of the Storm by that guy named, uh, um, ah, what's his name, Brother Steve? Koenig, yeah. Uh, that went through uh, all of the, the history of every time it seems like you know, we've uh, gone to join hands or shake hands or pat the back of a Palestinian, whether it be Arafat or anybody else. Every time, you know, a president goes over there to buddy up, every time we send a secretary of state over there to buddy up or an ambassador over there to buddy up, we wind up getting slapped upside the head with hurricanes, with tornadoes, with uh, just various things. It's, it's an amazing, the book's this thick, folks, and it is an amazing sequence of events when you stop and consider the things that go hand in hand. You can believe it or you can disbelieve it. But according to the Scriptures, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Verse 4, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me? What a thing to ask, right? What a thing to ask. Here's God saying, tell me, what sin has your, have your fathers found in me that they decided to dump me and pick up some false god? It's an amazing, kind of an amazing question. Look in a, um, uh, Micah, the book of Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Micah, chapter 6, one of those books that you're always relieved when you finally find. Micah, chapter 6, especially if you're leading the Bible study. <laughs> That'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Micah, chapter 6, and uh, 
Go over to uh, verse 2. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the uh, Lord hath a controversy with His people, and He will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. That's an invitation you don't want to take up, folks. Uh, if you think that the judgment seat is going to be, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for a little bit of a gripe session, you are so wrong. You are so wrong. The Bible says in that day that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. All right? You can't find anything wrong with God. Mealy-mouthed little sinners can sit down here and gripe and moan but when it comes to that day, you're going to find you have nothing to stand on. Your God is holy. Your God is right. He's always been right. He always will be right. He'll never be wrong. There's a lot of things that can go against us. There's a lot of things that we don't have to like. But in the end, your God is right. Now listen, there is no other people on the face of this earth besides Christians that can say that. Okay? I can tell you this. Allah ain't right. I mean, all you have to do is study just a little bit of theology to figure out that Allah is not right. The gods of the heathen are not merciful and they're not right. But your God is. Back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. What iniquities have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and become vain? Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And they don't remember that far back. They're not interested in remembering back. Well, you know, God did that then. Where is that God now? They don't ask that, she says. Verse 7, And I brought them, or I brought you, into a, a plentiful country, to uh, eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. Folks, that's what he did for you too, didn't he? He brought you into a fine place and you eat quite well. And I don't just mean physically, right? Um, I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Now, folks, uh, notice that that's God's land, and God considers that land His heritage. Now, I know that Israel is also His heritage. But that land is God's heritage, and that land is His land. And those people went in there and trashed up His land with false gods, the same false, false gods that had defiled that land before that God ran those other people out for. And um, God is upset. <laughs> he says, that's my land, mine heritage, and you've made it, you've defiled it, and made it an abomination. And folks, that's what the Jews have done. You know, and for a group of people whose very foundation was against idolatry and was for the, based on the Word of God, that group of people today are further from the Word of God than Muslims are. Most people don't realize, just even with Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism, just how far removed they are from believing the Bible. I mean, we're talking about the Ten Commandments and so on, but, but just even for the average Orthodox Jew folks, they don't really read the Bible. They read a book about a commentary that somebody wrote about a book about the Bible. They're, they're, honestly, they, many of those folks, even Orthodox Jews these days, are several, several generations removed from even studying the Bible. They're studying holy books written by rabbis that wrote commentaries about commentaries about the Bible. That's why they have no power. That's why a lot of times the, the words don't get through to them. I'm not saying none of them know the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying that. But, you know, all you have to do is, uh, you know, study a little bit of the tradition and stuff to find that, 
that they are, you know, we always talk about Roman Catholics uh, adding tradition in. Folks, Judaism is absolutely, is absolutely filled with tradition that has nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever. Tom? There was always remnants left. Oh, quite a few. He said, if you leave any of them, they're going to be uh, they're going to be thorns in your eyes. Think about that. That'll make your eyes water. Thorns in your eyes. Well, folks, uh, you're living it today. I mean, you see it today over there, where you know you have a a country and. Again, I'm reading another little book that uh, Josh and Christine gave me uh, about uh, the whole Palestinian conflict and all. Nothing, folks. I mean, if, if the, the, the headlines today in Israel are really not any different than the headlines from 50 years ago. It's been the same thing, you know, over and over again just continually. But those people that they left in, those Philistines, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, that's the people. <laughs> That's them. And they are thorns in the eyes of the Jews. All right, verse uh, 8. The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law, the scribes, knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a bad scenario. The priests don't know God. The scribes don't know God. The pastors don't know God. And the prophets know a demon better than they know God. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. What does not profit? Look in uh, Isaiah 57 real quick. Just a handful of things. Isaiah 57. Things that do not profit. Isaiah 57, go down to Isaiah chapter 57, verse 12. 57:12. 12, I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. <laughs> Best you can do is not good enough. Won't profit. Look in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, down around verse 030. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Folks, you have pulpits all across America. Um, uh, the UK and so on today uh, that do not profit the people that hear them at all. At all. Look in uh, Hebrews. Look in Hebrews chapter four, real quick. Hebrews chapter four, and we have to be careful about this too, because Bible believing churches, Bible believing pews are filled today by folks that are not profit as they ought. Notice uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. And I understand there are some dispensational implications here for sure. But verse 1, Let us therefore fear lest promise being left us of entering into His rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them... But the word preach did not profit them. Talking about the folks that did not go into the land when God told them to. And why not? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 
You have to be careful about hearing the Word of God and uh, not really believing it. Hearing the Word of God and not letting uh, it, it do what it's supposed to do. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Too many people sit in judgment of the Word of God these days. You can hardly listen to the radio without somebody correcting it in one form or another. Look in Hebrews 13. Let me show you one other thing that doesn't profit here. And there are others, but we'll not get too deep here. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Hebrews 13, 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Um, diverse, diversity of them. Strange as far as outlandish. Uh, today, uh, it's, it's what's sad is that you start talking about sound doctrine, which the Bible's for, and somebody will stand up and say, oh, that's just, uh, that's just real strange because they never heard it before. But it's sound doctrine. But you have to be careful of, of strange doctrines, outlandish doctrines, alien doctrines, doctrines that come you know, out of psychology or psychiatry, doctrines that come out of humanism, doctrines that come out of environmentalism, like we said got entire congregations going green these days. Now, you can recycle if you want to. If you want to buy one of those frilly little cars, that's fine by me. But if you're spending any time worried about the environment, you are wasting your time. Okay? That's a doctrine that comes from the world that makes its winds its way into a Christian doctrine. It's not right. Uh, Hebrews uh, 13.9 be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Uh, you know, you get caught up in uh, J.W. doctrine. It doesn't profit them. They wind up thinking that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Right? get caught up in Calvinism. You wind up thinking that you don't have to fulfill the Great Commission. You wind up getting caught up in hyper-dispensationalism and you start thinking that you don't need to be baptized uh, you know, to, to be obedient. That doesn't profit people. <laughs> All right, back to Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah 2, verse 8. He said, They've uh, transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal. We nail that a, a lot here a little bit later. And walk, walk after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. So God's pleading. Now, I don't know, what's your picture of God pleading? Somebody on his hands, you know, down on his knees, you know, with his hands folded, please, 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 crying, please, please. I don't know if the Lord does that or not. He sent his son who died naked and beaten on Calvary, I don't know if he needs to humiliate himself any more than that. You know? Come unto me, all you that labor and have heavy laden, I'll give you a rest. That, that's pleading. It's kind of interesting what's paired with pleading in a couple of places so that you don't think that... Let's see how I phrase this. Um, you don't ruin God's day if you don't repent. God's happiness does not depend on you. God's world does not revolve around you. He doesn't have to line you up. You need to line up with Him. Okay? God does delight in His people. God rejoices in certain things when His people do right. But don't think that God is some pitiable beggar of a figure that just sits around and weeps all day until you get right. Because it's not like that. Notice pleading here. Look at Isaiah 3. Isaiah 3, verse 12. Isaiah 3, 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh boy. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. That was just for context, although that was good stuff. Verse 13, the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. 
that pleading is accompanied by judgment. Yeah, God's standing uh, begging, but He's not standing with folded hands, you know, crying and wailing, please, 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 please. Then He's saying, you know, you better come or else because it's about to hit the fan. Uh, He's coming to plead, but He's coming to judge at the same time. Look again in Micah. Micah. Oh, man, I have to find that book again. Micah. Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Verse 2. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with His people, and He will plead with Israel. Okay, He has a controversy. It's, it's accompanied by controversy, and He pleads. And He did plead. But there came a day that God quit pleading. Now, folks, that pleading was followed uh, by the death of six million Jews you know, in uh, Nazi Germany. It was followed by uh, you know, the death of Lord knows how many hundreds of thousands of Jews uh, when Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., it was followed by the Jews literally being cast out of every country on the face of this earth with the rare exception. You know what I mean? So this pleading is not God having His day ruined because you don't get right. You understand what I'm saying? All right, Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 9. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Kittim and see. There's some argument about what that is. Uh, Kittim, the isles of Kittim. Well, Cyprus is pretty nearby. That's an island. There are islands off the Aegean Sea, uh, off of Greece and so on. So maybe some of those isles. For pass over the isles of Kittim and see and send unto Kedar. Now that's uh, Arabia, southern Arabia. And consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. What thing? Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? And you know, you stop and think about that, and you know, it is a pretty rare thing for a nation to change its gods. I mean, forever uh, ingrained in everybody's uh, knowledge now is the fact that most Arabians are Muslims. And to convert a Muslim is a major undertaking. And to convert an entire nation is a real undertaking. Because just in general, nations do not change their gods. You go talk to, uh, you know, the the, the Buddhists and so on of the Oriental religions and so on. uh, you, You just don't find nations that readily change their gods if they change at all. So what's the deal with Israel? She changed her gods. Right? She changed her gods. Back to uh, verse 11. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? I mean, their gods are not even real gods and they won't change. They're absolutely adamant. Um, But my people have changed their glory. It's not just that He's God. It's He's glory. Their, their gods are inglorious gods. They're sick little, little imaginate, imagined things. Their gods are cows and cattle and frogs and dogs and in India rats. And it's their god. They're pitiful, vile, little profane things. There are no gods. But, but God, the Israel's God, your God, is a glorious God. Hath the nation changed her gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. There's that profiting thing again from verse 8. Verse 12, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, 
and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You talk about a sad scenario. They've forsaken me, the real thing, and hewed them out something in place of it that can't even hold water. That uh, verse, I believe it was Talmadge that said that he never trusted himself to preach on that text. That he was afraid that he would get too uh, sarcastic and too profane because it made him so mad. So he refused to preach on that verse. As far as I'm concerned, he should have gone ahead, right? But he just said, he said he, he could not trust that he could contain himself to preach on that verse. Well, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. It's odd that Jesus Christ shows up, the water of life, isn't it? And hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Verse 14. Um, is... Israel, a servant, is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? And uh, the questions are rhetoric in that, you know, God did what? God delivered Israel. He went into Egypt to set Israel free, right? So why is Israel a servant? Why is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Why does he keep getting carried away uh, off into uh, you know Assyria. Why does he keep getting carried away by Nebuchadnezzar? You know, off into Babylon. Why do the Egyptians continue to harangue him? Why does he continue to have problems with the heathen round about his perimeter, always stealing stuff and all that? Why is he always being judged? You know what the Book of Judges is? The Book of Judges is just a thing up and down, up and down, up and down, where Israel continues to come in and get conquered. Then one guy rises up and delivers Israel, and God blesses him. And then after 40 years, they're back under bondage again, just over and over and over and over again. Why is that if God's delivered somebody? Verse 15, the young lions roared upon him and yelled. You say, what's that mean? Jeremiah chapter 50. I like it when the Bible, I like it when the Bible um, interprets itself. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 17. I, Jeremiah 50, verse 17. said back there that uh, the young lions roared upon him. Well, notice in verse 17, Israel is a scattered sheep. That checks. Israel's a, a flock, a flock of sheep. The lions have driven him away. Which lions? First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. They took, he took the northern tribes captive, and they never returned. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Those two young lions are Assyria and Babylon. <laughs> Clear? Back to verse 15 of Jeremiah 2. 2.15. 2, the young lions roared upon him and yelled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the children of Noph, that's Egypt, and Tahopanes, that's Egypt have broken the crown of thy head. The Egyptians were always out for it. Verse 17, Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? Whose fault is it? It's their fault. Well, God didn't fail Israel. Israel failed God, right? God does not fail you. You fail God. And uh, there's an awful lot that comes our way by way of reaping. And uh, in the end, you have to say, I've procured that for myself. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when He led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. In the end, sometimes the Lord leaves a people to themselves. You know, you, you pray sometime, you pray the Lord delivers somebody. And, uh, but again, I mean, you don't have a Calvinistic God. Your God is not a fatalist. I mean, God doesn't deliver anybody that doesn't want to be delivered. 
And so as long as somebody's hard-headed and stiff-necked and won't listen, won't reason, then the fact of the matter is that, just like here, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. You know, you're left to your own wickedness. You're left to what you've procured back in verse 17 to yourself. Thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that thy fear, that my fear is not in thee. That is, the fear of God is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest and playing the harlot. They, they said back there, I won't transgress. Look back at Exodus 19, just a second. Look what they said. Lasted about 14 minutes. Exodus 19. It's just one of the occasions. Exodus 19. Nineteen seven, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And uh, verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. There was a contract made right there. He says, You accept? They said, Yes, we accept. And buddy, the Lord held them to it after all these years. He's saying, He's saying, You said that you would not transgress. And then you turned around and on every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. Yet, yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. You know, in uh, Revelation chapter 14, it's kind of funny, when the Lord comes back uh, at, uh, at Armageddon to, uh, to reap um, the wicked, it says that what He comes down and reaps and harvests is the vine of the earth. You know, uh, He's likening the nations and people to, to, to vines. Israel was planted a domestic vine, a holy right seed, a right seed. But everybody else is the vine of the earth. The Lord takes that and burns it, throws it away. Verse 21, Yet had I planted thee a noble vine, holy, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know that thou know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her way. He says, you're like a camel. He's saying, you're like a beast. Verse 24, a wild ass is what you're like used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure in her occasion. Who can turn her away? He says, you're, you do what you want to do. You're acting like a beast. You're like a brute beast. All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. He says, you know, you're out, out there running around like a donkey in the wilderness, like a wild ass, but just like all donkeys, they wind up being caught one day or another. <laughs> Verse 25, Withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidst, There is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers and after them will I go. Let's pause there. We're going to have to break off and do something else here uh, starting there at that, that verse. We'll talk about it next time. Any questions or comments? Bryce. Bryce. Mm, amen. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. 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 Anything else? All right. Appreciate y'all coming out tonight. Let's turn to uh, one more before we go here. Let's turn to number uh, 272. 272. Appreciate a chance to pray here tonight, come together for a little while. Appreciate the folks that came. I ask uh, for your oversight for all the things we've already talked to you about here tonight. Uh, remind us of these things that are most important in prayer, Father, uh, that we may keep them before you. I pray they'd made, make a difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, folks. Amen.